for that nice little introduction. Hey, um, I think one of the things for the future is connectivity, and um, Andy has got that. And just a quick story about him and I. Uh, three years ago, I was sitting in the Cory Lounge in Wellington um, with my computer up, um, typing away, doing my thing, and I look up from my computer and Andy is sitting opposite me. What are you up to? I'm in Wellington on transit to Christchurch. What are you up to, Sarah? I'm in Wellington on transit to Auckland and I'm thinking about hiring a strategic marketer for a project that I've got. I, knew, I know a few strategic marketers, Sarah. Let me have a think about it. I get up to Auckland an hour later. I get into my hotel another hour later. Sign on to my email and Andy has emailed me three strategic marketers he's known. He knows. Uh, he's spoken with all of them. They were all keen to work with me and I hired one the next day. So um, the power of connectivity and I think um, if we can all be as connected as Andy is, we will be streets and streets ahead of the pack. So um, that's just my first little thought on the future. Let's get as connected as him. He's pretty much linked in. <laughs> Let's call him Facebook, whatever you want. He's linked in. The brief um, that Ice House gave me today was to tell you where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, but in, in preparing um, to speak with you all, and I'm, I'm speaking amongst my peers, you know, it occurred to me that everything I was writing down was pretty much common sense. And everything that we've done at Trilogy, in my mind, is common sense. So I think common sense must be, you know, an exceptional thing to have. So I googled it and I found a few definitions which I think are quite relevant. Um, the first was, you know, one of the ones I love, the ability to discern what is intelligent and what is stupid. <laughs> a form of knowledge used by a now currently extinct species of human known as intelligent individuals. Well, the, the guy or girl, I'm picking it was a guy girls, that said that obviously doesn't know currently instinct means extinct. <laughs> so he had, no, he had no common sense, girls. An oxymoron, you know, is it common to have sense? And the one I particularly like for today, and you should remember while I'm speaking, is this definition. A phrase used by someone who wants any critical analysis of what they're about to say to stop immediately. <laughs> It is just common sense, really. Um, so who, who are we? As Andy said, we're a 10-year-old natural skincare company. It was started by my sister Catherine de Groot and I. We now employ 33 staff across three um, offices in Melbourne, Wellington and London. Um, within our 33 staff are three lucky, lucky men. That's a ratio of 10 girls to one guy. So guys, if you want a job at Trilogy, we're probably going to welcome you. We started with just about five face care products, a nice way to launch into retail because retail does not like you to, to, um, to stress them out and, and to present a lot of risk. So we started with just a tight little range of five products. We now have over 40 in our range. And, uh, and you know, if, if you know the Trilogy brand, you'll see that we, we take several shelves on every major retailer that we, that we focus on. Um, why do we start this business? It was personal and professional. Firstly, my sister and I wanted to work together, and secondly, we come from a very, very entrepreneurial background. So there are personal and professional reasons that we wanted to work together, but there's no apparent common sense in why we started Trilogy. And let me tell you, that's not a bad thing. Firstly, I'm an accountant, and my sister's a journalist. So why would you start a skincare company with that background? You know, at the time we started Trilogy, there were 25,000 skincare brands available to the market. Currently, there are 500 available to New Zealand Pharmacy alone, and they take typically 15 brands per store. So a competitive environment uh, where, again, we appear to be idiots. We started out in Trentham, our part to Trentham. <laughs> Trilogy from Trentham. It's not L'Oreal from Paris, <laughs> is it? So we look like nitwits, but um, I guess you'd say this is called guts. Just uh, incidentally, are there any accountants here? Hands up. Hands up, right. Okay, we are actually quite cool, aren't we? <laughs> Seriously, we're good fun. 
Aren't we? Oh. <laughs> we are. We, are, we have got heaps of personality, we're charismatic, we're onto it, we're good people. So don't judge me or these guys or whoever else put their hand up over there just because we're accountants. Hey guys. Um, what we, you know, with this apparent lack of common sense, what we did see um, in the market about 15 years ago was a massive move towards everything going natural in the world. And at that time, I was running a manufacturing company um, and I was producing bulk ingredients for the health supplement industry, so your um, Health Reads Blackmores type ingredients, uh, Eden Primrose, those kind of products. And um, we were approached by a cooperative in Africa to produce Rosapoil. I didn't know anything about Rosapoil at the time, but we started producing Rosapoil. It was from a fully sustainable source, it was certified organic, and it was 100% natural. And I started exporting it immediately to France and to Japan. And Japan and France are recognised as the biggest and most successful cosmetic formulators in the world. So if you like, a light went on in my head, and I, this is when I started chatting with my sister. And at the same time, we, we also noticed a massive trend in FMCG towards things going natural. You could see in supermarkets, um, particularly in Europe, <coughs> That, that categories, yogurt was going, you know, completely natural. And uh, we could see in categories in the FMCG that, that the market was moving towards consumers making a more natural choice. We also noticed in Australasia, and I think it's important when, you, um, when you're starting a business to, you know, to, to look in your own backyard first, we also noticed in Australasia um, a big, wide, gaping hole in the channels that women buy skincare, being pharmacy and department stores, but any natural offerings. And when we started Trilogy 10 years ago, there was not one single brand that had what I would call a pure natural offering in pharmacy and department store. So combination of finding this amazing ingredient, Rosapoil, and seeing this big gap in the channels to market that women buy skincare, led us to actually just get straight to it, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, as I said, not think about it too much and get straight to it. And what we really felt about the category as a whole was quite different to what was going on in natural skincare, which was happening in a very niche way in those days, but um, we felt that what was happening in natural skincare was far too complicated and women were wanting to, to make a more, um, a more simplified choice in terms of what they bought. We found that the brands in our category were really unsophisticated. We really wanted to take the hippie out of natural and, and make it mainstream and, and make it accessible and affordable. And we, and we also knew and still know that, that natural doesn't mean natural. So we wanted to create a brand that was you know, truly set up to its ethics. And so what we were doing really is sensing what, something that would become common. Our business model to start this company um, was also pretty simple. We started Trilogy with $20,000. And we have never ever outsourced funding, never taken on external shareholding or bank loans. Um, and you can do that. You can do that by outsourcing talents that you don't have yourself. And we felt our talents were going to be in marketing, even though I'm an accountant, my sister's a journalist. See, we're creative, us accountants, are we? Um, so we, we thought our, our talents would be in marketing, in branding, in formulation, and, and obviously in finance. We outsource and still outsource manufacturing, sales, distribution, and retailing. So our whole supply chain is currently outsourced, and that gives you a great amount of flexibility in starting a business. Um, you don't have to outlay a lot of capital, and you can um, you can you can start with you know, a lot of flexibility in terms of the way you think. So essentially, Trilogy is a marketing company. And, you know, we sell this company with no money, so I always call it marketing with no money. And I also think that um, the best ideas for marketing come with unrestrained thinking. So the fact that Kath and I, um, and uh, neither of us, A, come from the skincare industry, or be uh, um, educated marketers, or you know, trained to be marketers, was a huge, huge advantage to Trilogy getting ahead, because we just have thought our own way, 
as opposed to what is industry norm. So we're not constrained whatsoever, and never have been, by traditional marketing techniques. And this has given us a huge advantage in, di in differentiating the brand. From others, and you'll see on the screen, or you may already see on the screen, that um, one of the faces of Trilogy is a orangutan welfare, not a supermodel from New York. And you know that's that's how you think when you're you're not when you're constrained by money, but you're not constrained by thinking. Um, our other major marketing strategy in the early days, in particular, was what we call a push strategy, and that um, you know it's twenty it's twenty thousand dollars to place one ad once in a third of a page in an Australian newspaper. So we couldn't afford to do that. So we we used a push strategy, which was to go through our supply supply chain and get them to love us, L-O-V-E. So our suppliers love us, so they deliver whenever we need, and if we're under pressure, they deliver. Our distributors love us, so, you know, they're selling five or six different brands at any particular time, but they're probably selling Trilogy over our competitors because we've got them to love us. Our retailers love us because, let's face it, we're giving them a great deal. Um, and our retail staff love us because we incentivise them to sell Trilogy products. So girls, I don't know how many of you use Trilogy. Hopefully quite a few. Shall I ask you to put your hands up? <laughs> put your hands up then. Oh, yeah. oh good, 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 good. Um, so you have probably been sold to, uh, on incentive by a, a, a retail um, assistant in, in, a, in a pharmacy or a department store. Um, and, and this this scheme involves, you know, literally us saying when you sell X amount of product, send in your receipts, we will we will then give you a free product of your choice. Write them a handwritten note, tell them what's going on in the business, tell them how much we love them, flick it back to them and they love us. The our our um, retail incentive scheme is so successful that I have worked out ways to disincentivize the incentive scheme. We have people working full time in all of our offices processing our sales incentive schemes. So, you know, marketing with no money isn't that hard if you focus on who's important to you. And the supply chain should never ever be underestimated in terms of importance in marketing. Um, supply chain feeds product out, feeding product out then um, breeds word of mouth. Word of mouth is the ultimate marketing technique. Don't, un don't underestimate, as Annie said, our capability to generate press. Um, PR, free advertising if you like, and that's also been a major strategy for us. So has um, customer service. Customer service is key, and I'm going to touch on that a bit later on. But essentially, we had a push strategy. Low cost, very effective way to start a business with no money. So where are we now? Where has this got us? We're in uh, 4,500 outlets across 15 countries or continents. My um, favourite market is Antarctica. Trilogy is sold in Antarctica. I'm the sales manager for Antarctica. <laughs> Even though I'm not operational there anymore, I am still the sales manager. I'm not delegating that to anyone. It's massive business for us, it's about $500 a year. <laughs> um, so if I should be able to convince my board uh, that, you know, I think it's $20,000, is it, to get down to Antarctica? If I, if I should be able to convince my board that their $500 a year return on $20,000 investment is good, I'll, uh, I'll write a blog and you can all read about it. Um, incidentally, Antarctica took on Trilogy because of our ethical, um, natural standards and, and the fact that all our products are recyclable, etc. Uh, as I said, we've got offices in, in Wellington, Melbourne and London. We're on the Deloitte Fast 50 for three years. We grew 44% in the recession, 25% in the year after the recession. We're the number one general cosmetics brand in New Zealand pharmacy. We're bigger than L'Oreal. We have the number two and number four selling best selling best selling moisturizers in New Zealand pharmacy. We're the number three and fastest growing brand in my department store. We sell a rose coil every 60 seconds somewhere in the world. We sold in prestigious retailers all around the world, Meyer, Boots, Harrods, House of Fraser, John Lewis, Isita, and you name it. And also, as Annie said, we've won numerous awards, but I think the one I'm most proud of is we won the Supreme Award, uh, Supreme Business Award in Wellington um, in 2010. 
and that was a big buzz. We didn't win our category, and we were really peeved. Really peeved. You know, it was a, we were in the exporter of the year category. We thought we might win. And um, the MC dropped a hint <coughs> after, um, after, that category, uh, after that category was announced, saying that, you know, you, you might not have won your category, anyone, but you could still be up for the Supreme Award because we were all about to get up and leave. But <laughs> luckily we didn't. Um, you know, and the icing on the cake is you start a business for 20k and you sell it, sell it for 20 mil. <laughs> Just like that, common sense. <laughs> so, um, you know, what is our focus now? Where, where, where are we going? Um, to be perfectly honest with you, it's, our focus is not a lot different to where it's always been. And, and I want to start, and some of you that have heard me speak before you would have heard, heard me say this, but people rule. So our focus still remains around people, and the future still is with great people. And when Kath and I started Trilogy, we literally, like I'm wired now, somehow, wired ourselves for success. Like, literally wired ourselves. I did not want to go back to being an accountant. No offence, boys, girls, boys, girls. Um, and she didn't want to go back to the pressure of deadlines on journalism. So we wired ourselves for success. And with that came this thought that success is an attitude, and it really is an attitude. So when we're hiring, we're hiring attitude. We're not hiring skill. Um, and we do, we hire every single, except for you're talking about particular, um, you know, technical skill, we are hiring attitude, first and foremost. And we've been extremely successful at Trilogy at upskilling people with the right attitude. You know, we've taken the office manager in three years to be the senior brand manager. One of the most important roles in our business, because brand is everything. She went from three years from office manager to senior brand manager because we recognised the talent in her, we nurtured it and we, and we ran with it. And so did she, because she had the right attitude. Um, with that attitude, I think personality is really, really important. And I sort of have a role that, and it's hard, it's hard to work out how you hire people like this, but I have a role that you hire givers, not takers. And it's a little bit like, um, if you have a morning tea, are they the person that hands the sausage rolls around to everyone else? Or that goes up to the table, takes four and goes back into the corner and eats them themselves? And that's a way of, you know, ascertaining a giver versus a taker. Um, are they a sausage roll giver or do they take four? <laughs> and, you know, in my case, if, if they don't offer me tomato sauce, then they're definitely not in. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we're looking for givers, not takers. We're looking for positivity. We just don't do negativity. We just don't do negativity. And I think, you know, in my experience in the last um, 10 years of many fellow entrepreneurs, you really don't find entrepreneurial people that do negativity well. Our glass is always half full, and on Friday nights our glass is pretty much full. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, like, we like people that look at opportunities, not with that kind of fear, or even worse, more work kind of attitude. We're looking for people that look at opportunities with excitement, <laughs> and I can progress, I can get ahead, I can win here, this is going to be good for me and good for the business. Um, so, you know, and that inherently we're looking for risk takers. And I'll just tell you quickly a great technique we've got at Trilogy, which is low cost. It costs us $1,200 on sale to, um, to, to find a way of recruiting these people. And it involves um, three chairs at the reception of the Trilogy office. Two of the chairs are kind of conventional, you know, like we're sitting in, although they're not totally conventional, but they're, they're conventional chairs. One of our chairs in the Trilogy office um, is a bow concept chair. It's kind of laid back and it swivels. It's very cool and modern, got a high back, low seat. It's set away from the other chairs in the sun. Harder to get to, but it looks like if you got there it'd be more fun. So we have a... Um, it's got out of control now, but we so we now have a you know a, a kind of a view that when we're recruiting someone, we look at what chair <laughs> they sit in for the interview. Poor buggers, um, and you know typically typically.
quickly, when you're going for an interview, you would sit in this upright chair, wouldn't you, with your CV, and you'd just be sitting there. Um, but we're looking for people that sit in the swivel chair because the swivel chair represents fun, it represents risks, it represents getting out there a bit, it represents individuality, it represents everything that we're looking for in those criteria that I um, described to you earlier. And we've had phenomenal, phenomenal success in hiring people that have sat in the swivel chair. <laughs> it's out of control, phenomenally successful. And it's got so bad now, and the photocopy is just along from reception, and everyone knows it in the office now. Everyone knows that if they sit in the swivel chair, they, they've got a way better chance of you know, getting the second interview. So you find that this poor person is sitting for an interview, all these people are up at the photocopier, all of a sudden there's a hell of a lot of stuff being printed. And then they come back into the main office and they go... <laughs> <laughs> to whoever's doing the recruiting. So $1,200 on sale from Bow Concept, go and grab them. Um, I'm not even a shareholder of Bow Concept, which is annoying now. I should be. Uh, so that's how to hire people, and, and, I, and I, I believe that it's all about people, people rule. Culture rules too, and culture rules um, more now than it ever, ever has, <coughs> particularly with the younger generations coming through. It is not enough for us to expect um, the younger generation, my generation, and even older who are savvy, to consider um, that they can work in a traditional office, with a traditional hierarchy, with a traditional physical structure. We've got to change the culture of the way that we work. And uh, work hard, play hard, get home to your family, don't, don't sit at your desk till 7.30 at night, finish at 5.30, get home to your family, play with them, that's the best thing. Don't take yourselves too seriously at work. Um, and this all breeds success. I really, really believe it. And we've had a big culture around relaxed style. Don't, no blame, just fix it. Ultimately, as the CEO of Trilogy, I was responsible for any major mistakes, so why do I blame? I shouldn't blame. Um, the blame, would, the people that are dedicated to what they do, the blame comes from the process. Fix the process and get on with it. I think increasingly, we all know this, but increasingly customer experience rules I feel, you know, my father's generation that suppliers rule, so if you like farmers, farmers rule what happens to the market. I feel now retailers rule what happens in the market, so um, a lot of what we see on retail sh shelves is dictated by retailer control, but the future is absolutely 100% in the hands of the consumer and the customer, and that is, you know, it's so, so prevalent from what we can see in digital space. So focus on digital space has to be absolute para absolutely paramount for the future because retailers will not rule when consumers start saying what they want and they can say it as vocally, as verbally and as connected as they can today. And that's just going to become more and more prevalent. For small business and small exporters, and I haven't touched a lot on exporting, but for small businesses and small export, Exporters, I think the, um, the future is focus. I, I, I really worry about the fact that a lot of New Zealand exporters try and go really wide, and I think we should be narrow and deep. You know, when we launched in Australia, uh, we launched in Australia at the same time as we launched in New Zealand, because I have an Australian upbringing, and so we had a, a sort of an inherent confidence in that. We're not just Australia at the same time. It took us five years to be cash flow positive. So you're not going into Australia, you know, as if you're going to make money overnight. Five years to be cash flow positive, seven years before we started make, making money. But it's now our biggest market. It makes, makes us the most money. So you've got to be really, really focused and narrow in terms of um, exporting. And exporting is really hard. So my kind of view on, on export is don't just go. I'm selling in 35 countries and they're cool because it's, you know, it's not an easy Fonterra. Um, I think narrow and focused and profitable for the long term is a, is a future for, um, for small exporters in particular. And, you know, my final comment really is for the long term future, I'll be dead by the time this happens probably. 
um, is that I, I don't think growth for growth's sake is going to rule. The future of this world is pretty challenged and the world's out using its resources. So growth, success or the stock exchange of the future will not be based on growth and profitability in my view. It will be rewarded on control and social and economic um, responsibility. And I think we will see a switch in the next 50 years towards that, otherwise we'll, we're, we're going to implode. So, um, you know, that's a sort of a, a deep philosophical view for the future, but we cannot keep growing, grow and growing without getting it right. So this all sounds like paying attention to the obvious, doesn't it? It's another definition of common sense. Cheers. Thank you.